what a joy it is to continue looking at the book of 2 Timothy. We do want to hope that you are growing as much as we look at this particular book. Particular story, as you can hear, is we are only now going to be finishing chapter 2, 2 Timothy. Uh, but of course, by the end of our trading, uh, my plan is that we have been able to finish the whole book. But I do hope by that, by biting these small bites uh, of sort of um, this particular book, that you are able to gain as much as possible. That's my prayer, uh, both to to be able to handle it yourself, to teach it, but more importantly for it to be able to help you as an individual. Uh, to remember those points I gave at the very beginning. To remember that this is God's word. This is first and foremost for your transformation. It's meant to come and to change you. Um, that that scripture in Isaiah comes to mind when I'm thinking about this. That you know, no word of God comes to us empty-handed, uh, sort of in vain or void, and goes back in void. You know, it will be able to accomplish the purposes that which God uh, did plan for it. So it's always good, again and again, every time we approach God's words, to be thinking and to be praying that God will take His word by His Spirit, change, transform our thinking, our reasoning, and even the way we do things. And I do want to hope uh, part of it is that that's what is going to change you by the end of these one or two years uh, that you have been with us, that this is going to transform, to change you for life, uh, indeed for eternity. So today our attention then, we turn to 2 Timothy. Uh, chapter 2, verse 14 to 26 is the last portion of this particular chapter. Um, and uh, in a short while I'm going to be reading and then we are quickly going to dive into it. But let me pray. O oh Lord, who is equal to this task? Not us, not me, and not even these men and women who are listening to me. Quite often we struggle, particularly as we hear a topic like today of thinking about God's servant. We can even shrink down and think, that's not me, and I can never be there. And yet, Lord, we pray that as we hear these words, as we hear Paul telling Timothy these words, as we hear Holy Spirit telling to us today, we pray that they will be changing, transforming, and helping us to be those kind of people who fear you and who walk in your ways. And all these things, Lord, please would you help me to be truthful, faithful to your words, and help us, Lord, to be able to digest it by the help of the Holy Spirit for the edification of the, of, of the body of Christ, and also, Lord, for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So let me write, re, read, uh, sorry, very quickly, then we'll dive into it. 2 Timothy, chapter 2, and verse 14 to 26. Remind them of these things, and chant them before God not to quarrel about words, which does no good but only ruins the hearers. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed. Likely handling the word of truth. But avoid irreverent bubble, for it will lead people into more and more ungodliness, and their talk will spread like gangrene. Among them are Hymenaeans and fighters who have swerved from the truth, saying the resurrection has already happened. They are upsetting the faith of some, but God's firm foundation stands, bearing the seal. The Lord knows those who are his, and let everyone who names the name of the Lord depart from iniquity. Now, in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wool and clay, some for honorable use, some for dishonorable. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from what is dishonorable, he will be a vessel for honorable use, set apart as holy, useful to the master of the house, and ready for every good work. So free youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. Have nothing to do with foolish, ignorant controversies, you know that they breed quarrels, and the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponents with gentleness. God may perhaps grant them repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth, and they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil, after being captured by him to do his will. 
what should be the posture of God's servant in Swahili mtumishi wa Mungu nafaa kukaa namba gani what should be the posture Again, don't lose the thought that this is Paul talking to Timothy. Timothy is in Ephesus. There is probably false teaching going on. There is probably even persecution. But Paul himself is in, in dungeon because of the gospel. He is writing to encourage him to keep on, to hold to the truth, to guard the truth. But that seem like Paul is, you know, he seems, sees two things that go hand in hand. Preaching the word of the truth, but also the vessel or the man preaching that word of truth and need to concur. And so in this particular portion, and we already started this uh, in chapter 2, is Paul you looking at those characteristics, as you may call it, or those features, as you may call it, or what is expected of the man of God, the servant of God, uh, the one who will be serving. And, and, and that started really when he was talking about the soldier last last time we looked at that, an athlete um, or even a farmer. You know those illustrations were really trying to look out. You know this is the way, the posture of the Lord's servant. And here we have you know sort of three more um, uh, symbols or metaphors that Paul uses uh, to describe uh, this kind of a character of a person. And we are going to name them as our three points this morning that we are going to be looked at. So how should a servant, what should be the posture of a servant of God? One is approved workman. He should be an approved workman. That's verse 14 to 19. In verse 20 and 21, he should be a noble vessel. He should be a noble vessel. In verses 22 to the end, he should be a servant of the Lord, or the Lord's servant, as we get in verse 24. He should be an approved workman, he should be a noble vessel, and he should be a Lord's servant. I don't know what you would say is lacking in most places, and most churches. And perhaps we can all agree, maybe there is a need for faithful gospel teaching. That's why I of Africa exists and we try to, to train you and everybody else on, on how to faithfully preach the word of God. But sometimes something else that needs to go hand in hand with a faithful proclamation of the word of God is a faithful servant. Now most of you will be in churches where you have already experienced servants who are not faithful. They are neither faithful to the scriptures they are not faithful to the congregation. They are not faithful in the affairs of learning money. They are not faithful in the way they handle themselves. And the call for Timothy, as he continues to stand out and to be almost a lone ranger in Asia, because so many people are departing the gospel, is be set apart. Set apart as a servant of God, as a man of God is one who is for God. So the first point here that we get is, one, his exhortation to Timothy is to set himself apart as an approved workman. In fact, the word he uses there is, show yourself as an approved workman. In other words, prove yourself. Um, you know, if you imagine a sort of like competition, he sort of, go there, let, let people see you of what you can do. And so verse 14, all the way to 19, that's what he wants to say. And he tells him, remind them these things. I think it is things he has been talking about, and things he is going to be talking about. I think it is a gospel. So Timothy has been exhorted to remind the people, uh, to remind perhaps those faithful men that he is entrusting the gospel to. And what is he to remind them? Well, he is to remind them about not quarreling about words. He is to remind them about the disaster that comes from twisting the word of God. And as he does that, as he reminds them of the need for faithfulness and endurance and, and being like an athlete, a soldier, and a farmer, he himself, verse 15, is to do it himself, is to show an example, he is to present himself to God as one approved 
a worker who has no need to be ashamed because he is handling the word of God lightly. Oh, he is cutting straight the word of God. So Paul is really calling him in a very big way that do make sure, Timothy, that you handle the word of God lightly. And I think this is sort of an answer to how then do I present myself as an approved workman? Sometimes people ask in a CV, what should I include in my CV for me to be accepted in a program? And Paul is saying, one of the things that you need to do is to make sure that you handle the word of God in the right way. In other words, it's all that we have been saying. It's faithfulness of preaching the word of God. And, and in a short while, Paul will give him you know, bad examples like Hermanias and Philetus who have swamped the truth. But for him, he is to cut straight the word of God. He is, he is to be a man who seeks not men's approval and a prowess, but he seeks God's approval. Do you see that? Who is he to show himself approved of? He is to show himself approved by God. If a Paul is saying, here is the one person you need to walk to and show yourself that you are really up to the task of preaching the gospel, God himself. And how do you do that? By lightly handling, by cutting the word of God, by teaching it correctly, by handling it correctly. And as you do that, you know, you do not need them to be ashamed. In other words, hakuna ibu, because you know what you're doing, you're doing the right thing, there is no need to be ashamed. And as he does that, for sixteen, he is to avoid the irreverent bubble. In other words, it's empty rhetoric. Which, which doesn't lead people to, to any godliness. It only leads to more than more ungodliness. In fact, he uses a very strong word, verse 17. It is phrased like cancer or like gangrene. What a disaster to hear that the falsehood of the gospel leads, spreads like cancer. It kills people. And Timothy is to avoid that. And there are even examples, verse 17, that we get here of Hymenaeus and Philetus that are already teaching that resurrection that has already happened. You know how exactly that teaching was, was ended up? It could have been you know, saying you can have your better you right now or you have everything now um, or perhaps this is all there is. But look at what Paul says, that they have swallowed the truth that's verse 18. This is the sad reality of the false teaching. They serve the truth. Um, instead of handling light to the word of God, they are swerving it. They are sort of deviating from the truth. And what is the result? They are upsetting the faith of some. And that is a sad reality. That as we talk about false teaching, it's not just a different choice. It's actually that it has a lot of impact on people's lives. It upsets. It, it leads to other people not even um, you know, following in the path of the faith. And how do they do that? It starts with that, not likely handling the word of truth. Instead, they are engaging in a different bubble. What a, a disaster for us to be hearing there. And maybe you need to, to pause and to ask yourself, every time you get a chance to preach or to share the good news of Jesus Christ or to meet up with those young people or children or even the adults. Are you preaching, talking, uh, irrelevant, bubble, empty rhetoric or are you teaching the truth of the word of God? Is your teaching leading people to be more godly or ungodly? And even for you, is this truth leading you to be more and more godly or ungodly? And it's, it's such a huge warning, is it? Um, and no wonder Paul moves in to give a bit of assurance, verse 19, that God knows those who are his. That yes, on one hand, you know, it's, it really rests on what you are saying, what you are preaching, what you are teaching. But we can rest a little bit in, in this knowledge. That even though we may not be able to control everybody who is teaching there and what they are teaching, the Lord knows those who are His and He will preserve them as to the very end. In other words, if, you know, Paul is saying in a world that is ruled by words, the call 
is to handle the word of God rightly. In a place where things are just people, everybody is a commentator, analyst, everybody is a preacher and a teacher, what a higher call to handle the word of God rightly. And, and you are almost to assume as if God is in the audience. Look at that. Show yourself approved of him. Which makes it urgent, is it? That handling of the word of God rightly is urgent because God is our master. He is in the congregation. He is listening to us. But also because it has eternal effects on those who are hearing. If you are not careful, we might just end up misleading more people. Imagine if you work in an airport, you know, being in charge of communication. You're the one who communicates to, 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 to flights, which ones are to land, which ones are to take off. Imagine how risky that job is. It requires a high level of diligence. One small mistake could lead to deaths of hundreds, if not thousands of people. And he is saying, as you handle the word of God, that's in a sense, that's what you're doing. If you handle it rightly, to build people up, some people will be awakened up to believe in Jesus Christ. If you handle it wrongly, some people will actually stumble. It leads to ungodliness, did you see that? It causes others to stumble in their faith. In fact, Paul describes it as such, teaching us cancerous. It's very interesting how the false teaching spreads. You know, it trends very quickly and is widely shared on social media platforms, but clearly the truth of the word of God. Which is why we should mourn when people mishandle the word of truth. It's not simply a different style or a preference, you know. I think Kamau you don't like so and so. No, 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 no. It is fatal. Just the same way we we should not we should not laugh at a drunk person driving. Because they can easily lead to death of the so many lives. So it is for anyone who stands to preach, whether to young, to old, if they are not handling the word of the truth rightly, then we are in danger. How many friends and members of our family do we know that have been taken captive by false teaching on their faith and life has been ruined? You know, a good proportion of people have even left Christianity because of bitterness from false hope or even abuse. Take heed, friends, as we become irrelevant babblers who instead of teaching the truth but strengthen the faith of some, we wreck their faith. And instead of truth that leads to godliness, our hearers become more and more ungodly. But I need to quickly run to point number two. Because what else will mark as a servant of the Lord that has been called? And the other way that Timothy has been called to set himself apart is as a noble vessel. Now that's in verses 20 to 21. And now in a great house they are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for honorable use, some for dishonorable. Therefore if anyone cleanses himself from what is dishonorable, he will be a vessel of honorable use, set apart as holy, useful to the master of the house, ready for every good work. Quite a home illustration there of the mixed bag of people that you find in a church of God. Indeed, even in ministry. So you don't find one line of people, oh, nice guys who preach faithfully the word of God. No, no, no. In a church setting, I think that's the whole language here. You find all manner of people. So you find, for instance, there are those who are preaching for their own gains. There are those who are preaching for, uh, for popularity. There are those who are preaching for very good motives of wanting people to be converted. And Timothy is being told, look, in a big great house, there are all those kind of people. So what's the call here? The call is, could you stand out, Timothy? and be one of those noble vessels for honorable use. Look at that verse 21. If anyone cleanses himself from what is dishonorable, he will be a vessel of honorable use, set apart as holy, useful to the master, and ready for every good work. Timothy needs to make a choice here. Are you going to be an honorable vessel or a dishonorable one? 
And I think, how do you do that? And this is in the context of how you speak, how you handle the word of the truth. This is all connected in that particular context. So, to become an honorable vessel, it is to cleanse yourself from all the irrelevant uh, bubbling and, and false teaching. It is to rightly handle the word of the truth. It is to, to stick to being uh, God's, uh, anoint, uh, God's called one and God's purposes. It is to stick to the gospel. You have a chance, you have a chance here, Timothy. Paul is saying. Will you decide to go with the flow of Hermanians and Philetus? Or are you going to stand for the truth? But the last thing that he exhorts him in which he is to set himself apart so so far, so he is to set himself apart, is we, we have looked, the first point there is as an approved workman, he is to set himself apart as a noble vessel, and lastly he is to set himself apart as the Lord's servant. Or I get this particular Lord's servant from verse 24. So look at from verse uh, 22 uh, there. Free, youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love and peace along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. Have nothing to do with foolish, ignorant controversies. You know that they preach quarrels. And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponents with gentleness. God may perhaps grant them repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth, and they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil after being captured to him by his will. What a call for Timothy here, to be the Lord's servant, to be different, did you see that word again, to be set apart. And there are a number of things that, that Paul highlights here for Timothy, and I just tried very quickly to look at some of them. One of them is, I think there's that call for him to be mature. So he's talking about fleeing youthful passions. Um, now, don't know what are, uh, how do you know what do you know as a youth passion, but this will be things like arguments, rebellion, I think some of the things he has talked about, a uh, complacency, uh, maybe even lust. And those are things that he is to to flee from. Sometimes those those are things that, that draw people back. You, know, you want to, to argue and and compete and and, and get to the the things that everybody else is getting into. And Paul is advising uh, Timothy, so please free the youthful passions. And instead, what are you to do? You are to pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace along with those who call on the name of the Lord. So instead of uh, disagreements and arguments, he is to, pur- to pursue fellowship, verse 22. Don't be an isolated person. Look for others. Get into fellowship. So important for you to do uh, this apprenticeship as a family. Pursue people who will walk with you and, and encourage you along the way. But the other thing he has to do is to, to pursue discernment. So verse 23, have nothing to do with foolish, ignorant controversies. You know that they breed quarrels. Brothers and sisters, be discerning. Pray for the gift of discernment. Now sometimes we, we don't know when to stop, when not to pursue an argument, when not to even engage, even on social media. May you pursue just to know where to actually dip your feet or where not to. Be kind, he is exalted, verse 24. Be kind to everyone. What's the call? Everyone, you're thinking, be kind to everyone, including those approximate uh, leaders who are not logical or, or sensible, surely, including um, those other people who are not preaching rightly, surely be kind. Because, he reminds him, the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone. There's a huge temptation when you are young and you know the truth to actually be quarrelsome. And it's easy to be kind to those who are kind to us. But what a call here to be in a Lord's servant by being kind to others. But so quality, you are able to teach this is your gift. Can you teach others in the word of God understand? And he's talking about 
correcting his opponents with gentleness. I think this normally strikes me whenever I'm reading here. Because as a young person, when you know the truth, one of the things that escapes is gentleness. Oh, as you correct those other people with gentleness, don't, don't just um, correct them with sort of being puffed up by knowledge. And I think this is the opposite of what Paul says in Corinthians. Instead of being puffed up, is to have great humility and encourage and knowing I like that you have to correct them knowing that God may perhaps grant them repentance which is interesting and I think we need to understand this that it is not our sober very clear argument that we win people to Christ only God can do that it was not our argument that will win false teachers to this other side. Only God can be, give them repentance. And how do we know that? I, I like the way he's saying God may perhaps grant them repentance because it is only God who grants repentance. It's a gift of God. Praise the Lord. I think this gives you a great humility, brothers and sisters, that now you know what you know. But it is very easy to, for us to receive this is by grace but to want to punish others for not knowing them. Thank God that you know the truth. Pray and correct with the gentleness of those others. Maybe your friends, your courage buddies who, who, whose understanding is totally different and it is not right. May you correct them with gentleness. And, 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 and they can tell us the truth that we need to know, which is the truth that the reality of things is these people is not just that they are not logical. It is the devil, verse 26, has taken them captive. Which is sad. So as you go even to preach to people and you see people who are very against, very much against the gospel, it's good to remember that they are not the ones who are against God. They have just become ensnared by the devil. And so help them. Teach them. Pray for them. Even persevere. Because who knows? The Lord might just grant them the repentance. Friends, our call is to be set apart. To be set apart as approved workmen. To be set apart as noble vessels for good use. And to be set apart as the Lord's servant. There is our part. There is what we are to do. We are to work hard in it. You know, if you have to prove yourself as a workman, you have to work hard in it. You have to, to make sure that you, you, you get it. But also you have to walk in ways that pleases the Lord and, and be a noble vessel. And lastly, that great call to be the Lord's servant. Not people's servant, not uh, I serve servant, but be the Lord's servant. May the Lord help you as we apply these things in your life, in your ministry today, and as you seek to become a faithful servant of the Lord. Let me pray. Lord Jesus, would you please help us to be faithful servants of you, to know when to keep quiet, when to engage, to know the things to invest our time and energy in. And Lord, help us. We will be those who will cling to you up to the very end of the age. So help these dear ones in the prisons as well. That they will be tempted to beat shortcuts. May they remember to be that you are watching and to want to show themselves approved of you. But also, Lord, I pray for them who might be feeling that they are not being even appreciated to know and to remember and to take the great joy that you, Lord, knows about their labors and you approve about the work they do. So I thank you and I praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.